discussing the current affairs for the 25th of March 2022. Now the first topic that we'll be discussing is what is the government going to do in order to tackle the Russian trade hurdles. As you know, recently various countries uh, from the Western Europe and USA, they have imposed sanctions on Russia. And in, even the SWIFT transaction system has imposed sanctions on Russia. And hence, it becomes very difficult uh, to carry on trade in the conventional manner through the Russian banks. So we have to find an alternative arrangement like how India has with Iran. With Iran, India has the rupee real conversion system. With Russia, India wants to establish the rupee ruble uh, transaction system. Over here, there is no involvement of the dollars no dollars but rather uh, there is a direct selling of indian goods in rupees to russia uh, in russia and there is a direct purchasing of russian goods through the rubles okay uh, this will be maintained in an austro account in india itself all the money that has been collected through the sale of indian uh, exports it will be maintained in an account in Russia and that will be used to purchase for the Russian goods. Similarly, uh, Russia, uh, all the money that has been gathered through the selling of Russian exports will be maintained in an Indian account over here and that will be used for the purchase of Indian imports. So we shall discuss this in more detail. NIA probe sought to into a terror funding case. We will discuss about the steps of NIA and what are its functions and what is its mandate. And we shall discuss about this UGC's common entrance test for undergraduate admissions for almost all the central universities such as Jamia Millia, such as Delhi University, you know, all of them. Uh, the rest of the topics are things that we have discussed already, such as the Uniform Civil Code, FCRA registration. And uh, this will be a very static topic. Uh, just remember it from uh, the mains perspective. Uh, and so will this. The first topic, why is this in the news? The government has convened a multi-ministerial group to look into overcoming challenges in the trade with Russia, including managing payments for exporters and importers, external affairs minister had said in the parliament in comments that indicate a possible revival of the rupee-ruble trade. In the wake of economic sanctions against Russian banks and entities by more than 40 US and European allies, Remember, we spoke about the sanctions that are present and hence if India tries to deal with any of these banks, you know, that particular Indian entity or Indian company will also be blocklisted or that particular company will also be having penalties to pay. So instead of that, India is using the rupee-ruble conversion system where the Russian banks are not used or uh, there is no uh, transaction directly between Indian counterparts and Russian counterparts. Okay, there is no usage of uh, US dollars. Answering queries during the question are in the Rajya Sabha on India's stand on Russia and Ukraine, including some that raised concerns over India's abstentions at the United Nations and the impact of Indian policy on India's trade and ties with the USA. Mr. Jay Shankar said that India's position is for peace and that foreign policy decisions are made in Indian national interest. And that whatever decision India has taken, it should have no impact on India's trade, is what the external affairs minister had said. Why? I'm sure you know that recently also, India had made an abstention from uh, the UN resolution, which is condemning Russian uh, actions in Ukraine. India wants to maintain uh, abstentions because India wants to Maintain its ties with Russia. India has had very close defense and economic ties with Russia since a very long time. In fact, the defense ties, they have evolved from being just a buyer-seller to one in which they have joint research, development and production. They have a joint research now. In terms of production, development and research. Okay, there are several uh, uh, there are several entities that have been jointly uh, 
connected between India and Russia. Like say for example, the Brahmos. It was a collaboration between India and Russia. Also India and Russia are collaborating on the 5th generation fighter jet program. And then India and Russia had collaborated on the Sukhoi Su-30 MKI program. Okay, KA-2260 twin engine utility helicopters. This was even given by India to Afghanistan. Helicopters. And several frigates. So India-Russia collaboration has moved away from being just a buyer-seller agreement to one of joint research and production also uh, if you had uh, read the news india is also uh, having a joint production facility of the latest ak uh, ak rifles actually these are semi automatics uh, yeah ak203 i believe i mean this is the after version of ak47 Please uh, see what this AK is. I forgot AK203 is what I guess it to be. Apart from that, India has gone on to procure S-400 Triumph uh, missiles. This is a defense uh, missile defense system. It is the best in the world. We had discussed it uh, a couple of days back. It has a 400 kilometer radius. It can uh, protect, you know, it can protect the entity from, ab from about 400 kilometers far away. Also, India has purchased Kamo KA-226 uh, Also, we have purchased the T-90 tanks from Russia We had also taken the INS Vikramaditya aircraft carrier Aircraft carrier So, you can see that we have you know, we have purchased a lot of things from Russia and we also have a lot of items which are on joint production. So Indian-Russian defense or Indian-Russian uh, arms partnership has been there for a very long time. And it doesn't make sense for India to all of a sudden abandon Russia over this issue. Also, uh, India-Russia trade relations, uh, I mean, it is a very bright spot because India and Russia, they are expecting to increase our bilateral investment to about 50 billion dollars and bilateral trade to about 30 billion dollars it is somewhere around 15 to 20 billion dollars but it is expected to increase to 30 billion dollars by 2030 currently the bilateral trade between both the countries is around say between somewhere between 10 to 15 billion dollars and majorly it comprises of uh, defense trade and then after that energy trade okay so these are the components and also various fertilizers. No. Also precious stones. And apart from all of this, there is also a major collaboration when it comes to nuclear, nuclear technology. As you know, Russia was one of the first countries to establish its uh, nuclear plants in India. Okay, and then apart from uh, Bilai, there was also Russian uh, plant establishment in Kudankulam and Kalpakam. So, Russia has had a major uh, footprint in India. Yeah, moving on. Now, all of these questions were answered in the middle of the question hour. Okay. The comments by the minister come even as a number of countries in the sanctions regime against Russia have sent delegations to New Delhi. Okay. Asking India to be a part of the anti-Russia period that's happening. Okay. Now, but India does not want to limit the Indian purchases of Russian oil, which is being offered at a discount price. Actually, Indian purchases of the Russian oil are very small. They make up less than 1% of India's oil procurement. And India does not want to bend to the pressure of these countries, which are asking India to take an anti-Russia stand or support the resolutions against Russia. Okay, now what is the questionnaire? The questionnaire 
is actually nothing but uh, just a second the question r is the first r of every parliamentary sitting during this one r members of parliament ask questions to ministers and hold them accountable for the functioning of their various ministries however during the question r you can also ask members private members regarding their functioning private members as in mps who are not ministers regarding you know any incident that has happened in their constituency or regarding uh, yeah regarding any bill that they have introduced okay so it is not specific only to the ministers now what does this do this ensures that there is sufficient accountability of the ministers and it also ensures that there is sufficient transparency regulation it is regulated according to parliamentary rules the presiding officers of both the houses rajya sabha and lok sabha are the final authority with respect to the conduct of the question hours okay so the rules of procedure of the lok sabha or the rules of procedure of the rajya sabha are the commanding documents when it comes to question hour what are the different kinds of questions that are asked okay the questions uh, that are asked are start questions and start questions and short notice questions sorry short notice questions start questions are those questions that come with the form of a star it is given by a small star okay at the end of the question it requires an oral answer and hence supplementary questions can be asked later on you can follow up on the question itself however unstart questions are those which need a written answer and hence supplementary questions cannot be asked short notice questions are the ones that are asked by giving a notice of less than 10 days it is answered orally and hence you can have supplementary questions okay now question hour in both the houses is held on all days but there are two days when exceptions are given to the question hour one is when the president is giving his address either to the new lok sabha or the first day of a new parliament year or on the day the finance minister presents the budget even on this day you don't have any question hour okay moving on nia probes sought into terror funding case now we will read about the functions of the nia over here claiming to be in possession of a sensitive report pre- prepared by the mumbai police the leader of the opposition the maharashtra assembly demanded the case of a professional gang which has involvement in over 300 which has involvement of over 300 members involved in narcotics sex trafficking terror funding with possible links to be to the iss to be handled by the national investigative agency now what is this nia the nia is the central counter terrorism law enforcement agency it is empowered to deal with terror related crimes across the states without permission from the states you don't need to have permission from the states in order to deal with any cases which fall under the nia jurisdiction so this is unlike this is unlike the permission that is needed by the cbi now in case the general consent is withdrawn to the cbi then the cbi need permission from the states in order to investigate any cases that fall under the states why because law and order is a subject that falls under the state list and police is a subject that falls under the state list and hence this power remains with the states okay it was established under the nia act and works under the ministry of home affairs it's a central agency to investigate and prosecute these offenses uh those that affect the sovereignty of india security and integrity of india security of the state friendly relations with foreign states against atomic and nuclear facilities okay uh, offenses which are related to smuggling and high quality counterfeit indian currency so not just uh, terrorist related activities but also activities which concern atomic and nuclear facilities and the ones which are related to counterfeit currency and all of that okay now uh, uh like what we said the nia jurisdiction 
is basically not uh, is is not limited to the states or it's not limited to the states approval but rather it can act even without the states approval okay um, it was established after the mumbai terror attacks of 2008 because it was there was a need that was felt to investigate all the terrorist related activities and take action on the terrorism okay no uh one more thing is that a state government may request the central government to hand over the investigation of a case to nia provided the case has been registered for the offences as contained in the schedule to the nia act within the schedule to the nia act we have different different offences like terrorist activities like offences against uh, nuclear facilities or ac- atomic related issues or even issues that are related to arms or issues that are related to counterfeit currency counterfeit okay so under these uh, cases you know the states can ask the center to hand over the cases to nia the central government can also order the nia to take over the investigation of any scheduled offense anywhere in india so the power to give cases assign cases to the nia lies only with the central government and not with the state governments please remember this the composition officers of the nia are drawn from the indian police service indian revenue services okay no apart from that the nia's various missions are nia's various missions are investigate professionally the scheduled offenses utilizing the latest scientific methods okay use scientific methods in the investigation apart from that facilitating a speedy and effective trial okay ensure fast trial okay and also ensure that the nia upholds the constitution and the law of the land okay and it also has to create a professional workforce through regular training through adequate training of its personnel and then show scientific temper and use science in its investigations okay they also need to have cordial relations with central and the state governments and other law enforcement agencies okay and uh, ideally they have to create and share with the states and other agencies a database of all the information related to terrorists they have to remember this they have to create and share with states states as in state police all information related to info related to terrorism but this hardly ever happens this seldom happens because nia feels that if they start sharing too much of information then the state uh, police will start taking cues and they'll start you know working on these cues and that's the reason why there is not enough um, i would say partnership or cooperation between the different police agencies or the different investigative agencies special nia codes various special codes have been notified by the central government of india any question to the jurisdiction of these codes is decided by the central government itself i mean the the codes which are created by the central government its jurisdiction is decided by the central government again these are presided over by a judge appointed by the central government on the recommendation of the chief justice of the high court with jurisdiction in that region the supreme court has also been empowered to transfer cases from one special court to any other special court also they have been given the powers of the court of sessions an appeal from any judgment of the special court lies to the high court and state governments important can also establish such special courts so not just the central government but also the state governments can establish the special courts ugc is ugc is common entrance test for undergrad admissions so this common admission test 
common central test will be for all the 45 central universities. Okay. The UGC has announced that admission to the undergraduate courses in all centrally funded universities will henceforth be solely on the basis of a common university entrance test. This means that all 45 central universities will have to admit students on the basis of their scores on the test. Class 12 board exam marks will no longer be considered. Now what is this common university entrance test? It will be a computerized test to be conducted by the national testing agency. Following the exam, the NTA will prepare a merit list on the basis of, these, on the basis of which these universities will admit the students. The entrance test is compulsory for all central universities and may also be adopted by state private deemed to be universities. While it is compulsory for the central universities, it is optional for the state universities or the private and the deemed universities. The entrance exam will be offered in 13 different languages. International students are exempted from the CEOT. Their admissions will be carried out using the existing uh, way that it's happening currently. Now, one more thing is that this entrance exam there are several domains which are involved in this entrance exam okay uh, even when colleges are hiring for accountancy or chemistry you know chemistry or biology you know even these colleges can go for this common university entrance test i will tell you what the format of this test will be Okay, the first part of uh, the test will test the candidate in a language of his or her choice. First part will be language based test. Now in this language test, there will be say reading comprehension, listening comprehension, all sorts of things. Okay, apart from this, the second part of the test will be technical. It will be domain specific knowledge. It will be related to whichever course the candidate wants to get in like accountancy or chemistry or biology. And based on this, okay, and based on this, the merit list or marks are given and the merit list is prepared for that particular domain. It will be a three and a half hour computer based entrance test and it will have multiple choice questions based on the con content in NCRT textbooks. Okay, it will be a three and a half hour test and it will be based on MCQs. Now, in this the third part of the test, there is also a third part of the test. Okay, uh, and the third part of the test will be a general test with questions on general knowledge, current affairs. So on the basis of these three things, a merit list is prepared. Now, one thing is that all courses need not use just this or all universities need not use just this COET merit list. Okay, uh, depending upon what courses they are offering. Say for example, skill based courses which have major practical components such as music courses or painting courses. In those courses, Along with the COET test, you know, universities can also conduct practical exams or interviews. And for professional programs such as MBBS or engineering, then central universities will have to admit through entrance exams such as JEE and NEET. Okay. While for skill based courses, they can use this along with COET, they can use this for professional courses such as MBBS and engineering, you have separate entrance test. Okay, a separate entrance test. Such as, you know, IIT, for IIT you have, uh, I'm sorry, for IIT you have uh, JE, for MBBS you have the NEET exam. Okay. Now, Okay, now why is the government favoring the COET exam? 
so that there is a level playing field for aspirants as different examination boards in the country may mark students differently okay like say for example some boards some state board uh, some state boards give more marks while some state boards give lesser marks and that creates a big discrepancy it will also save students from the stress of impossibly high cutoffs last year eight du colleges had set cutoff at 100% for 11 courses okay it is also expected to reduce the financial burden on parents and students as candidates will only have to write one exam and not one separate exam for every central university okay we had discussed about the national testing agency some time back please refer to that video i'm not going to discuss about it again in detail you know that nta is responsible for conducting various competitive exams like neat je ctet from now on it will be conducting even the cuet it is a society under the indian societies registration act and it is autonomous self sustained testing organization only for the first year 25 crores will be given after that the nta will have to sustain itself through the funds it collects for organizing various entrance tests okay please read through the rest of the nta uh, because we have discussed it in detail now after being sworn in the uttarakhand cabinet led by the chief minister on thursday decided to form a cab committee of experts for the implementation of the uniform civil code in the state so uttarakhand might be one of the first states in the country after goa to establish a uniform civil code now what is a uniform civil code like what we had discussed earlier uniform civil code is not one set of rules for the entire country rather uniform civil code is a set of rules for every community based on some overarching principles like the constitution of india it says that you know all the religious laws or rules should be based on say the constitution and hence because the constitution of india has principles has the same principles such as equality such as rights such as fraternity such as liberty you know because all these religions will then be based on the constitution of india they will have similarities or they will have a common base and in that way all of them will be equal to each other and that is the concept of uniform civil code but it's not you know the same rules for every religion in india you know that most of the major religions have a, a government approved uh, civil code or a government regulated civil code like for hindus there is the hindu marriage act or the hindu property act for parsis also there are acts for sikhs there is an anand marriage act okay and amongst the major religions only the muslims don't have a codified uh, religious law no codification has been done of the religious law and hence it will be a lot more helpful if there is codification of this religious law based on uh, you know based on synergizing the islamic rituals with the constitution and that is the goal of ucc the constitution in article 44 requires the state to strive to secure for its citizens a uniform civil code throughout india but till date no action has been taken in this regard the uniform civil code okay this is within the dpsps directive principles of state policy and since this is not compulsory till now uh, there has been no ucc it seeks to provide one common law for the entire country applicable to all religious communities in their personal matters such as marriage divorce inheritance adoption currently only the muslim personal laws are primarily unmodified and traditional in their content and approach while the other major religious personal laws have been codified and hence codification of this traditional muslim laws on the basis of some principles which are found in the constitution it will result in uniform civil code you Un- need of uniform civil code it ensures equality presently in india different communities are governed by different personal laws okay so codification will result in some amount of equality between various communities also it will be important for national integration because that way the importance of religion will be a little reduced and hence it will be better for national integration 
it will improve harmony in the society it will also ensure that women who are discriminated under the religious laws of most of the religions will have better condition ucc will promote gender justice by removing the inbuilt discriminatory provisions of personal laws under hindu law of mitakshara it was denied to the hindu daughter a right by birth in the joint family property freedom of choice a religion neutral personal law would encourage protection of couples in the case of inter caste or inter religious marriages problems of ucc also you know there are several problems in the implementation of ucc such as you know there are several communities or several tribals who don't follow the pro- principles of uccs and they follow their own set traditional principles you can't bring all of them under ucc so why do you want to bring only muslims under ucc also article 371 a to i and the sixth schedule of the constitution provides certain protections to the states of assam nagaland mizoram goa with respect to family law hence this would be a contradiction to bring them all inside the ucc and if you are not bringing in these communities and these states within ucc then why do you want to bring muslims alone these uh, states they have some amount of protection with respect to the traditional laws and uh, uh, so ucc cannot be implemented uh, as per textbook definition okay plurality and diversity like what we said several tribals have plurality uh, they have different different beliefs you can't bring them all under ucc also the law commission chairman the law commission chairman the previous law commission chairman had stated that it is not possible to bring about ucc in the country after major research the freedom of religion goes into conflict with the right to equality which is nothing but article 25 versus article 14 in the name of uniformity the minorities fear that the culture of the majority is being imposed on them hence in the way forward what can be done we can have a piecemeal approach in case if at all there is one discriminatory practice that comes to light that discriminatory practice is addressed like say for example triple talaq since it was a discriminatory practice it was addressed by the supreme court and hence it is better for the supreme court or the judiciary to address this thing in a piecemeal approach so that there is no politicization okay moving on fcra registration of ngos extended The Ministry of Home Affairs has extended the validity of FCRA registration of NGOs till June 30, revising its previous extended deadline. Earlier, the Ministry of Home Affairs had extended the registration of NGOs till March 31st, and now this has been extended till June 30th. An order by the MHA said that the validity of the registration certificates of such entities whose renewal application is pending will stand extended till June 30th or till the date of disposal of new application of renewal application. whichever is earlier in case of refusal then the validity of the certificate shall deemed to have expired on the date of refusal itself and the ngo shall not be eligible to receive foreign contribution or utilize the foreign contribution that it has received already the order said that the fcr entities whose five year validity period is expiring between april 1st and june 30th and that have applied for renewal before the expiry of registration will also be extended till june 30th this is because there is a huge backlog of renewal of fcra application of uh, of fcra licenses and because of this backlog the government has automatically decided to extend these applications till uh, extend the registration till june 30th now what is this fcra fcra is a license which is needed by all the ngos in order to carry out operations in india in order to receive from in order to receive funding from abroad okay it falls this foreigners contribution regulation act it falls under the ministry of home affairs while the fema foreign exchange management act it falls under the ministry of finance it's an act of the parliament enacted in 1976 and amended in 2010 The objective is to regulate foreign donations and to ensure that such contributions do not adversely affect the Indian security. Why? Because earlier it was given in a report by the IB, 
okay the green piece was engaging in anti national activities by taking funding from outside or or even the kurdan kulam protests which were happening were happening at the behest of foreign intervention also the ford foundation was receiving funding in order to disrupt the unity of india these were the allegations made against ngos and hence it is necessary to see where these ngos are getting funding from and if they don't have any ulterior motive registration is mandatory for all ngos to register for register to register themselves under fcra and it is valid for 5 years the registration can be renewed subsequently if they comply with all the norms registered ngos can receive foreign contributions for five purposes only social purposes educational purposes religious purposes economic and cultural purposes okay they need to have a separate account listing the donations received from foreigners and they need to get it audited by a chartered accountant and they need to submit it to the home ministry every year okay though the registration is valid for 5 years if at all this uh, if at all this ngo does not file returns every year of the money it receives in its foreign account uh, then the ministry of home affairs can cancel the registration of the ngo okay however ngos are debarred from receiving foreign contributions when it's related to elections or it's related to cartoonist editor publishers of a registered newspaper judge receive judge receiving uh, funding from abroad government servants receiving funding from abroad members of legislature or political parties receiving funding from abroad recently the fcra was amended regarding transfer of foreign contribution any foreign contribution cannot be transferred to any other person unless such a person is also registered for the same purpose also uh, it form it also forbids okay giving of funding or sub granting by ngos to smaller ngos who are working at the grassroots you know ngos can't set up their own smaller ngos which work at the grassroots also all their funding has to be received in a single fcra account which is in the state bank of india new delhi branch no funds other than foreign contribution should be received or deposited in this account the act states that a person may accept foreign contributions if they have obtained a certificate of registration from the central government they have taken prior permission from the government to accept foreign contributions also the amendment makes it compulsory for all trustees to register their aadhar card with the fcra account and also there has to be a reduction in the usage of foreign contribution received from 50% to 30% or to 20% for administrative purposes earlier 50% of the funds could be used for administrative purposes now it has been reduced to only 20% of the funds the rest of it has to be spent on operations india to be tb free by 2025 okay recently this was a goal that was already set by india and this was reinforced by the health minister who held that the government's commitments to making india tuberculosis free by 2025 will remain and this will be achieved by ensuring access to quality healthcare and advanced treatment recently in the year 2021 a 19% increase was witnessed in tb cases from the previous year the number of incident tb patients both new patients and relapse patients notified during 2021 was 1933000 as against 16 lakh in 2020 noted the india tb tuberculosis report about 19 lakh people whom cases have been Uh, tested and diagnosed and in those uh, there have been relapse cases the report said that despite the decline in tb notifications observed around the months corresponding to covid-19 waves the national tuberculosis elimination program reclaimed the numbers it means that this national tuberculosis elimination program has revamped the testing this testing had actually dipped during the covid arrangement and the ntep has reclaimed these numbers it said that 18 states have committed to ending tb by 2025 by implementing state specific strategic plans and have devised a district specific strategic plan which shall serve as a guiding tool for the program managers okay 
Now, the government also released one more report known as the National TB Sur Prevalence Survey Report, which was conducted between 2019 to 2021. And the report said that there has been an increase in the mortality rate due to all forms of TB between 2019 and 2020 by 11%. All forms of TB, this can be multi-drug resistant TB or this can be extensive uh, drug resistant TB or this can also be normal TB. So there has been an increase in the mortality according to the National TB Prevalence Survey Report. What is TB? <laughs> Tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria that mostly affects the lungs. TB is spread from person to person through air. When people with TB cough, sneeze or spit, they propel TB germs into the air. Now, cough with sputum and blood at times, chest pains, weakness, weight loss, these are the symptoms which are associated with TB. TB is treatable and a curable disease. What it needs is a 6 month course of 4 antimicrobial drugs that are provided with information, supervision and support to the patient by health worker or a volunteer. Anti-TB medicines have been used for decades and strains that are resistant to one or more medicines have been documented. Okay, These are the resistant strains. The multi-drug resistant tuberculosis and it is caused by bacteria that do not respond to isony acid and rifampicin. These are the first line drugs and the TB that does not respond to these two uh, drugs is again uh, treated by the multi-drug. It is called as the multi-drug uh, resistant tuberculosis and it needs a different set of drugs to be treated with. Also, you have the extensively drug resistant TB which is when MDR TB can't be revived or it cannot be cured by the second line TB drugs, then it is known as an extensive drug resistant TB. Okay. Now, first line of TB can't be treated by isony acid rifampicin goes to MDR. This can't be treated, it goes to uh, XDR. Okay. This is how TB evolves. However, it can be treated if any of these things, if TB at the first stage itself, it is treated through a standard six month course of four antimicrobial drugs, then it can be treated forever. World Air Quality Report. Okay, recently we can see that New Delhi was voted as the world's most polluted capital in the world, even ahead of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is the world's most polluted country in terms of air pollution. Uh, this World Air Quality Report was released by IQ Air, which is a Swiss group. And it measures air quality levels based on concentration of PM 2.5. Remember this. Bangladesh was the most polluted country and it recorded an average PM 2.5 level of 76.9 micrograms per cubic meter in 2021. As against the World Health Organization's permissible levels of 5 micrograms per cubic meter. This is the WHO recommended levels. 5 micrograms per cubic meter while in Bangladesh we had 76.9 micrograms per cubic meter around 20 times more okay earlier in 2018 19 and 20 also Bangladesh was the most polluted country and no single country in the world has managed to meet WHO's air quality standards in 2021 93 cities reported PM levels at 10 times the recommended level among the cities Dhaka was the second most polluted city in the world you know, just behind New Delhi, which had a PM 2.5 level of 85 times. I mean, of 85 micrograms per cubic meter. This is around 20, I mean, it's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for the numbers. I think it is 16 times. Uh, because it is uh, 75, it would be 15 times. And this would be about uh, 16 times or actually 17 times the the amount of pollution that is recommended by the WHO. New Delhi continues to be the world's most polluted capital for the fourth consecutive year. As per the report, India was home to 11 to 15 of the most polluted cities in Central and South Asia. 35 Indian cities have been listed under the index. While Bivadi Rajasthan topped this list, Ghaziabad Uttar Pradesh followed this list later on. 